Thanks for the opportunity to present here today. I acknowledge the Ugambe and Combamere peoples as the traditional owners of the land we're on, pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to the many traditional owner groups of the Great Barrier Reef and to any First Nations people in the audience. Um, in this 10 minute talk, uh, I'll whiz through some of the highlights and outcomes from a decade of human dimension monitoring in the Great Barrier Reef by the Social and Economic Long-Term Monitoring Program, also known as CELTEMP, uh, which was conceived back in 2011 in response to a knowledge chasm that had been recognised by the Reef Authority for a um, Over the last four years, CELTAP has been funded by the partnership between the Australian Government's Reef Trust and the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. Um, and the, Marine, the Reef Authority and the Queensland Office of the Great Barrier Reef and World Heritage have been um, key partners um, for um, doing this work throughout. So, as most of you will know, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park was established in 1975. It turns 50 next year. Scientific monitoring of the reef's ecological values commenced in 1983. So the AIMS Long-Term Monitoring Program, or LTMP, is the most comprehensive and extensive record of coral status on any reef ecosystem, according to their website. But by the time they had started, the reef was already a fundamentally altered ecosystem from a century of coastal development and extractive industry. Nonetheless, the LTMP and similar programs provide the foundation for our understanding of reef, reef health and how this is changing over time. What they're telling us in the scientific consensus statement and the outlook report is that the reef is in serious trouble and it needs us humans to change our current course to prevent irreparable degradation. So these findings then influence government policy, like the Reef 2050 plan and the Water Quality Improvement Plan, which plot a new course to a future with a healthy reef that contributes to our well-being. However, sailing to that uncharted destination is not so straightforward. It requires people across multiple communities to stop doing many of the things that they're accustomed to, to adopt new practices that might come at a cost. And if we don't have an understanding of the human dimensions of the system and how they're changing over time, we're effectively sailing without paying attention to the weather, as well as the crew and the passengers on board. And so CELTEMP was established, led by Nadine Marshall from CSIRO, Marg Gooch from the Reef Authority, Renee Tobin from JCU, and with input from a lot of other people. Um, CELTEMP's original monitoring framework came from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, essentially a modified DIPSA model that shows where humans fit in the drivers, pressures, state, and so on, in a linked social ecological system. And underpinning many of the indicators are many other models from social science literature that explain constituent parts and relationships for things like well-being, vulnerability, stewardship and governance. CELTEMP's data is mostly from large-scale surveys of different reef communities. Prior to COVID, we had teams of researchers deployed across coastal towns, armed with iPads, maps and minties, surveying people face to face. In 2021, we switched to online surveys and expanded our spatial footprint to include residents further from the coast in the wider catchment. And over a 10-year period, CELTEP has engaged with more than 22,000 respondents who've shared with us their values, uses, perceptions and attitudes across more than 100 metrics relevant to the reef and catchment. So for the rest of this talk, I'll skim over some of the insights and contributions that have come from CELTEMP over the last decade. So, from our 2013 baseline data, a paper led by Jeremy Goldberg quantified the importance of the Great Barrier Reef as a cultural icon for Australians. Before then, we all knew intuitively that it was important, but surprisingly, this was the first study to show empirically that the reef can inspires Australians around the country, instills a sense of pride and responsibility to protect it, and that climate change is perceived to be its biggest threat. Several other papers that came from those the baseline data set contributed to an improved understanding of de the dependency of people on the reef and different communities' sensitivity to environmental change, varying levels of trust in different reef institutions between different community groups, the relationship between peoples and different groups' trust and their, other, and their perceptions of equity, equity and legitimacy of reef governing bodies, the relationship between people's environmental values and attitudes, including pride and identity associated with the reef and their pro-environmental behaviours. The role that reef tourism operators play in communicating the threat of climate change to reef visitors. Now that study described an ingrained hesitancy across the industry to even mention climate change. That was a decade ago and since then there's been a cultural shift and today most tour operators and guides are strong advocates for climate action. Not all. 
Looking at values associated with the reef among local, national and international communities, a paper led by Georgina Gurney um, described how place attachment can bridge geographic and social boundaries and how communities of attachment might be leveraged to foster transnational stewardship movements. And finally, um, Marg Gooch um, that led a synthesis, synthesis paper that described the importance of human dimension monitoring for reef management and the value of different types of indicators and how this monitoring integrates with targets and objectives in the Reef 2050 plan. So <clears throat> moving forward in time, the summers of 2016 and 2017 had a profound effect on the reef and on communities and led to a major shift in reef policy. Community responses to those events were evident in our 2017 replicate surveys with significant changes observed in a lot of the indicators. And we provided a summary of these changes in a series of reports, which hardly anyone read. But in a few papers that did generate some interest, we zoomed in on people's emotional responses to the coral bleaching and a shift in their climate risk perceptions. So a paper led by Nadine Marshall coined the term reef grief and made an important empirical contribution to emerging literature on ecological grief, which is associated with the loss or degradation of natural ecosystems and affects our mental health and well-being. And papers led by Alaric Tholt and I explored how a high-profile climate risk event and its media representations contributed to a major shift in public perceptions about the immediacy of the climate threat. Fast forward a few more years and there's been lots more change across almost every aspect of the social ecological system and our daily lives. In terms of reef protection and management, we've transitioned into a new paradigm of ecological interventions, and we've seen investment into expanded human dimension monitoring, which is great. Along with CellTemp's continuation, there are three new programs initiated to better understand and monitor reef uses and benefits, stewardship and governance. CellTemp underwent some redesign work to make it more fit for purpose, which is assessing progress towards Reef 2050 objectives. Um, but we added a module that partners with the five regional report cards of the Great Barrier Reef region to monitor human dimensions of catchments and coastal waterways. And while the reef tourism industry was suffering its worst years on records thanks to COVID, we investigated factors that contribute to its resilience and adaptive capacity that can be monitored in future. So what is CellTemp showing us lately? So I don't have much time left, but I've picked two figures to show you from our latest core module report. One finding is that public climate risk perceptions have changed again, but instead of increasing public awareness and recognition of the immediacy of the threat, we've observed growing climate skepticism among residents who live in the Great Barrier Reef region. And secondly, we've measured a significant decline in residents' trust in reef science institutions and the reef authority since 2017. So it's important to note that our survey data can be used to investigate potential predictors of observations like this and over the last 18 months we've worked with management partners and students to explore topics and questions of scientific interest and relevance to reef management. So those in-depth studies include one that was just published in the journal PLOS One about understanding and engaging with communities in the Great Barrier Reef region that are mistrustful of reef and water quality science and my esteemed colleague Danny Nemhart presented preliminary results from this study at last year's symposium in Cairns. And I'm delighted that at this symposium today, um, other esteemed colleagues are presenting three new studies that have drawn on cell temp data. So, um, this morning we heard one on social licence for different types of reef prediction initiatives led by Ingrid, Ingrid Nashwitz. I'm hoping we'll hear one soon from Melissa Hampton-Smith on procedural equity and public perceptions of fairness in reef decision making. And this afternoon there'll be a presentation on the role of self-efficacy and how this influences people's reef stewardship actions led by Jane Doucet. So all three studies have contributed, contributed novel and important findings that are relevant to reef management and we hope to see them published and put to good use soon. Um, as I wrap up, I'd like to reflect on the role of human dimension monitoring into the future. If there's anything we can be certain of, it's more change for the reef and its connected ecosystems, for the people who depend on them and society at large. So we clearly need people and communities to work together to achieve our common goals and to do that effectively, we need to understand each other. Continuing monitoring of the reef's human dimensions will therefore be essential to understand and navigate through this change, to inform management decisions and actions, to evaluate progress towards our goals and to help decision makers and communities adjust course to avoid hazards. So CELTEM is just a small part of the great body of social science work and expertise represented here at this symposium. 
And the knowledge we're all generating is absolutely critical for us to stand a chance of reaching our desired destination. So let's keep strengthening our partnerships and building our collective capacity. Thank you.